Good morning. I'm glad you're here. Uh, welcome to the service today. Hopefully, before too long, we'll be able to be back together physically. And I want to encourage you to determine to, to grow in the Lord during this time. Make this a, a time of, of strength. And uh, this is what God is going to share with us this morning from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you have your Bibles. And uh, the, the very first verse, he says, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. God wants us to grow. They knew what God had said. They knew what had been taught them. He says in verse 2, For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. And he was encouraging them, keep growing. And that would be my encouragement to, to you today. Keep growing in the Lord. Use this as a time of, of growth. In um, this, this chapter, he talks about growing in, in sanctification. And he talks in verse 3 about how uh, this is the will of God, your sanctification, holiness of, of living, growing in our, our walk with the Lord, uh, growing in God's will for us. Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3.18, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, both now and forever. So I want to encourage you this morning, uh, walk with the Lord and uh, be growing in, in your walk with the Lord. Last week we looked at the walk of holiness, walking in holiness, and we saw that God tells us, don't let your body control you. God and His Word need to be in, in control. Uh, don't live like the world, He said. You know, we don't have, have to be like everyone else. And then he, he told them, be a blessing, not a problem. Don't defraud people. Uh, love them. And I found verse 7 a particular blessing. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Uh, that's God's call for our life. Uh, what a blessing that uh, that's what God intends and that's what God wants for us. You know, if you're saved, the Bible teaches that you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And if you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, God says you cannot continue to live in sin. That is, is just not going to be a possibility and you must love the brethren. The very first fruit of the Spirit is, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Uh, God and His Holy Spirit uh, give us that ability uh, to love people. Jesus' instructions in John 13, a, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. So, this week, right, we're going to be looking at walking in harmony, walking in love, and also walking in honesty. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and just a few verses this morning, verses 9 through 12. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 9, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. These are just some real simple parts of the Christian life, uh, simple duties. Someone has called this uh, shoe leather faith. Uh, you know, our, our faith touches the ground. It, it's, not, it's not just ethereal. It has, a, it has a practicality to it. Now, this is the normal Christian life he's talking about. And as he calls us to sanctification, sanctification will change you. That's the whole purpose. As we draw close to the Lord, as we, as, as we grow in holiness, uh, we'll be changed. Uh, don't just tell people what you believe. Show them. There's no testimony like a changed life. And God gives us four basics this, mor this morning uh, that have to do with the normal Christian life, particularly there in, in verse, uh, verse 11. Uh, love each other more, is, I'm sorry, is in verse 10. And then lead a quiet life, mind your own business, and work with your hands. Uh, that's pretty practical, isn't it? So he calls us to walk in holiness. Now he calls us to walk in, in harmony. We're to love each other more. Verses 9 and 10, 
He says, as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. But, as t- uh, this is something that we need to be uh, aware of and to be, to be growing. We need to be loving each other more. He said this before, 1 Thessalonians 3.12, The Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men. Now, he makes the transition from holiness to love. And that makes sense. Uh, God's love is holy. You know, one of the reasons people have such a, a problem with love is that they mistake lust for love. People do all kinds of things. They say, oh, I did it for love. Well, they didn't do it for love at all. They did it for lust. They did it to satisfy the, themselves. God's love is holy. And when we see the holiness of God, we can begin to understand the love of God. The Bible tells us God has given us his love. Uh, Romans 5, 5. That he says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. God has given us his love uh, in Christ, in the cross. But particularly when you get saved, God gives you the Holy Spirit. And God has poured his love uh, into you. So uh, our love for God motivates this goal of of holy living. Now in verse 9, he uses love twice, and each time it's it's different. The first one is brotherly love. You're probably familiar with the Greek word Philadelphia. Uh, Brotherly love. But at the end of the verse, he says, you are taught of God to love one another. That's a different word. That's agape love. That's John 3.16 love. That's the highest form of love. And I think what he's saying here is, if, if you have the highest form of love, hey, you can practice lower forms of love. When you have the love of God, you can love your brother. You can love your wife. You can love your husband. You, I could go on, couldn't I? You can love your children and, and, and so on. Uh, brotherly love and, and godly love. And he says in verse 10, and indeed ye do it. See, love is something we do. It's not just something we feel. In fact, sometimes you'll have to love in spite of your feelings. (laughs) And uh, that can be hard. Uh, Love is normal between Christians. Uh, That's why he's saying there in verse 9, you need not that I write unto you. Uh, This is just the norm. Uh, This is what Jesus said. That's the commandment he gave. There's quite a bit in the book of 1 John about love. And I thought I'd read a couple of statements he, he makes here in 1 John. 1 John 2, verses 9 and 10, for instance. And he gives us the contrast between love and not love. 1 John uh, 2, verse 9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness, even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. He says, love is the difference between being in darkness and in light. When you're in the light, God's love has been poured into you. Uh, In 1 John 3, verse 14, again, the same contrast. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Pretty strong words. Very familiar verses are 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. See, God calls us to walk in harmony. God calls us to love each other. That's just the norm of the Christian life. Now, that doesn't mean you'll never have any problems with other Christians. Sure, you'll have difficulties, but there are opportunities to grow in faith to grow in love. You know, it's easy to practice love when you're all, everything's hunky-dory and everything's satisfactory. It's when things are are a problem that you have to really practice love. Someone has written, to dwell above with saints we love, oh, that will be glory. To dwell below with saints we know, well, that's another story. (laughs) We need to be careful that we're not just putting love in the theoretical category. God says it's something that we do. Indeed, ye do it. We need to walk in harmony. God intends for every Christian to be a functioning part of a local church. 
Listen, that's where you get to practice love. That's where you get to practice it in spite of difficulties. In the home as well and in life, but particularly in your church. Then as well, he, he continues and, and tells us we need to walk in honesty. And he gives several uh, different things about that. In, um, in verse 11, that you study to be quiet. That word study means make it your ambition. It's the same word that's used in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Make it your ambition to get God's approval. Well, he's saying here, uh, make it your ambition to have a quiet life. <laughs> now, one of the things he tells us later on in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, he talks about prayer. 1 Timothy 2.1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. God wants us to be a, a part of our community. God wants us to pray for people, for those in, in leadership, so we can have a quiet life. You know, we need to have a, a peaceful attitude. Uh, I find there, there's some people who, uh, they don't feel like they've, they've really had an experience unless it's, it's been uh, wild, you know, unless there's been something Something strange going on. Listen, don't live for the noise. Live to have a quiet life. God tells us that. Don't live for the, the disturbance. Uh, live for the, the calmness that comes from uh, character and from the things that God wants us to have. God says in Hebrews 4, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. God wants us to live by faith, and faith has character. See, a quiet life is based on the foundation of order and character and godliness. The reason people don't have quiet lives is they don't have order. You never know what's going to happen in their life, and so it's, it's in turmoil. Uh, they don't have character. You never know how they're going to respond to something. Might be good, might be bad. Uh, you know, they have an exciting life. Often they end up in prison or, you know, exciting things happen to them. But that's not what God's called us to. God's not called us uh, to noisy lives. He's called us to godliness. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6, he says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Let me encourage you. Uh, make it your ambition to have a quiet life. And that starts with character and godliness and order in your life. Then the, the next thing he says there in verse 11, and to do your own business. We might say, mind your own business. <laughs> uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11, he says, We hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. A, a busybody is someone who is prying into other people's lives. A useless activity. Just, uh, they got nothing to do, so they, they get carried away with others. Now, I think this relates to, to Matthew chapter 7, when he says, when you, you, you see a, a beam, in, or you see a, a mote in your brother's eye, I should say, uh, he says, first of all, get the beam out of your own eye, then you can see clearly to help your brother get the mote out of his eye. Uh, start with your own business. When you see a problem in somebody else's life, stop and think, well, why do I notice this? What is God trying to teach me? How do I compare? Now, don't confuse this with love. Uh, God does want us to love others. He's not saying you don't have anything to do with anybody, but it needs to be done from a loving attitude. Mind your own business, and then he says, and work with your own hands. Those two go together. <laughs> uh, when you don't have any business of your own, you tend to be a busybody into other people's lives. Now, God doesn't say that you have to have a job. He does say you have to work. Uh, go through the book of Proverbs. Uh, man, he talks about the, the lazy person. That's not what God intends for us. Uh, I remember one man some years ago, he wasn't working, and I was encouraging him to get a job, and his comment was, well, you know, if I got a job, they could just fire me. <laughs> and it reminded me of the Proverbs where the, the man wouldn't get a job because he said, there's a lion in the streets. 
yeah, there's always something that could happen bad when you get a job. But listen, it might not too. And you might be obedient to the Lord. God tells us to work. Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 5. And let me read that whole passage there. We, we read verse 11. I want to start with verse 5 because he, he starts with the love of God. The Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. A lot of what he's talking about here in, in Thessalonians has to do with Jesus coming again. And there were folks who weren't working because they thought, well, Jesus is coming again, so we'll just wait till he comes. <laughs> Uh, he says, this patient waiting uh, for Christ, verse 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after th the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. Paul is saying he didn't just live off of them. He worked. And, and he said as a, as a pastor, as a, as a, a minister, he had the, the right to ask them to support him. But he didn't because he wanted them to have the example of hard work. Verse 10, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now, them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. God says, work, work with your hands. Uh, there's a lot of reasons we work. Uh, we work so we're not a problem to others, he talks about there uh, in verse 8. It uh, wouldn't be chargeable to any of you. Uh, we work to obey the Lord. God tells us to work. In verse 10, uh, we commanded you, if any would not work, neither should he eat. Uh, in other places, 1 Timothy 5, 8, for instance, we work to provide. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, 8, if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. I mean, even lost people know uh, you need to go to work. You need to do the things that, uh, the hard thing. In Ephesians 4, he talks about we work so that we're able to give. You know, God, God is a giver, and uh, we're to be the same. It's an interesting scripture. Ephesians 4.28 says, Let him that stole steal no more. <laughs> but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. God wants us to be givers, and the only way we can really give is when we give something we've earned. Listen, if you give what I've earned, that's not giving. That's called stealing. <laughs> you need to give what you've earned. Uh, we need to be people who are people of character, and God says we need to be people who, who work. You know, I mentioned some of these early Christians believed Jesus would come any day, so they, they just quit working and waited. Well, evidently they got bored waiting, so they became busybodies. And you know, there's been many cults and individuals who tried to predict the exact day Jesus would come. Uh, there's even been uh, ones where they've, they've sold their possessions, they've, I don't know if they put on robes and have sat on the hill waiting, this is the day Jesus is going to come again. Well, the Bible says no man knows the hour or the day. Uh, Jesus is coming again. And, and how, how foolish they look. There's been various cults, uh, Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses and different ones who, who predicted days. And when he doesn't come, how foolish they look. And then they have to make up a different story. Well, he wasn't really coming. He was going to clean out the temple in heaven or something. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15 says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. God doesn't say sit around and wait. He says, redeem the time. Man, if you only have a day, use the day. If you have 10 years, use 10 years uh, for the Lord. Work with your own hands. Jesus is, is coming again. Now, all of these have to do with our testimony. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 12 that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without. 
You know, people who are not Christians see us as Christians, and we have a testimony to them. If we're lazy, you might be the only Christian somebody knows. And if you're lazy, they'll say, well, all Christians are lazy. If, if you're dishonest, they say, well, Christians are dishonest. We have a testimony, not only for ourselves, but for, for our Lord. Walk honestly toward them that are without, that you may have lack of nothing. You need to have a, an honest testimony. That phrase, walk honestly, means walk decently. Do the right thing before God, before others. You know, sometimes there's things we do because of our culture. Uh, listen, our culture is no excuse. There's cultures where the right thing to do is to lie. Listen, as Christians, it's never right to lie. Now, Matthew 5 and verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now God's light, uh, God's testimony may offend them, but they'll know God's testimony. They'll be convicted by their sin as you live for the Lord. You see, our, our hope is in the Lord. We need character in our life. We need order. It's not the noise of life that makes it a good life. It's the structure and it's the direction. Uh, Jesus told a story in, in Matthew chapter 7 of the wise man who built on the rock. Storms came, his house stood. The foolish man built on the sand. The storms came, his house fell. Listen, don't be that foolish person. Don't uh, live for a noisy life. Live to have a quiet life in Christ. Are you building on Christ? That's the question. What is your testimony? What is your testimony? Let me give you two extremes to avoid. Some people get so excited Jesus is coming again, they ignore normal life. They're not normal at work. They're not normal at home. They're, not, they're just not normal people. They get so excited Jesus is coming again. You, you know, somebody said, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Listen, God put you on earth for a purpose, to redeem the time. The other extreme is, people are so indifferent that Jesus is coming that they're consumed with the world. Don't be that, uh, that foolish one who's, who's so caught up with things that they're, they're not prepared when, when Jesus comes. God says in 1 John uh, 2 and verse 28, Little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. God tells us, while you're waiting for him to come, abide in him. Be aware of his presence. Be aware of his instructions. You know, like he said there in, uh, in Thessalonians, you need not that I write unto you. You already know many of the things that, that you need to do uh, as a Christian. What's your testimony? This week I came across uh, Philemon verse 6. He says, That the communication of thy faith may become effectual. Y your testimony, the communication of your faith. God says it can become effectual. Have, have good um, uh, work by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Your testimony will be effective as you are understanding what God has done for you and, and responding to it. You know, I think many times we're so miserable about our Christian life, other people think, well, I, I don't want that. <laughs> we need to have the joy of the Lord. And we need to understand all the good things that, that God has done for us. And we need to understand it ourselves, but it also will affect our testimony. We acknowledge all the good things that we have in Jesus Christ. You know, the world doesn't really need so much to hear what we believe as they need to see what we believe. We need to live what we believe. And people will be changed by that. See, the Christian life is very practical. It's not just a spiritual thing that has no earthly good. It results in a holy life, a harmonious life, an honest life. And the reason that it comes down to is in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. The reason the Christian life is so practical is that it has hope. 
Paul wrote in Corinthians, if Christ isn't risen from the dead, I am of all men most miserable. Listen, we have the hope of the resurrection. We have the hope of the presence of, of God in our life as Christians. We have the hope of, of eternity. He's prepared a place for us. We have hope. And uh, it makes a big difference uh, in how we live today. He's written to us. He says there in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 9, Ye yourselves are taught of God. And God works in our hearts. Uh, if your hope this morning is in Christ, you'll know that you're saved. If your hope is in yourself or in a church or in a ceremony, you won't know. But if your hope is in Christ, God has written in 1 John 5, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. I would close by asking you, where is your hope today? It will be reflected in how you live. You know, if you have questions about this message or about how to know the Lord, I'd be more than happy to have you call me or contact me. If you're not sure how to do that, go to our website, fbcbrisbane.org. That's fbcbrisbane.org. Uh, there's a, a pamphlet on the website that will explain salvation, but it will also tell you how to, how to contact us and uh, be more than happy to, to talk to you about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the best thing that ever happened to me was when I trusted Christ as my Savior. And uh, I know the same would be true for you. Eternity, man, it, it's, what, it's what this life is all about. Let's go to him in prayer and, and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you're with us as we live from day to day and as you give us instruction on how to live. Father, I pray if there are those listening that are not saved, that your Holy Spirit would convict them and call them to yourself. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.